Let's take our Bibles and look once again in 2 Kings chapter 6. My text is going to be from verse 24 down to verse 33, and I want to speak with you about God's hand of judgment. Just as we've just read about in Revelation chapter 6, this is a God the world does not know, and uh, that's why there's no fear of God. But when God exercises his judgments upon the unbelieving, that's where people begin to see something of his holiness and his justice. The only reason we, who are the Lord's, that he's chosen and given to Christ, need not fear, nor do we need to question what is taking place in this world, because we know that the Father has purposed to glorify his Son. And every judgment of those that God the Father gave to his son, Christ is born. That's the comfort. But there are those who are yet in darkness and blindness and given over to idolatry, much like these in Israel, that is, those that were part of the ten tribes that went into apostasy and established the worship of the golden calves again, and those two kingdoms that we've been reading about where it mentions Israel and Judah, the king of Israel, that has to do with these tribes that were caught up in idolatry. And even though for a while it seemed like they had gotten a reprieve, yet God purposed that there would be a day of reckoning. And that's really what we're going to read about here in verses from Second Kings chapter 6 and verses 24 to 33. But just to help us keep the context, what we've seen to this point in the first part of this chapter is God's hand of mercy. How his hand of mercy was on those sons of the prophets that the Lord had raised up and they lost that ax head. And it's interesting that the, the scriptures say that the Lord caused the ax head actually to swim that is, even though the current was going this way, the axe head was actually going against the current, swimming toward one of the sons of prophets to where Elisha told him to pick it up, even though it had fallen in the water. Such is the mighty hand of God. That was an act of mercy. And I know as we look back on our lives, those of us that are lords, we can testify to many times when all you can say is God's hand of mercy was upon us and whereas a situation seemed impossible yet the lord turned it to his glory and for our benefit but also so that's verses one through seven we saw that in verses eight and following we saw something of god's hand of protection when the syrians plotted really they were coming down to capture elisha and they had besieged and surrounded the city where he was. And his servant, it wasn't Gehazi, he had been struck with leprosy, but another one of Elisha's servants that the Lord raised up, when he saw the army, he quaked. He was fearful. But that's where in verses 14 through 17 of our text, Elisha prayed to the Father and asked him to open his eyes that he might see something that natural eyes couldn't see. And when the Lord opened up his eyes, what did he see? He saw a mountain that was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha, his protection. This wasn't just a figment of their imagination. We're talking about there in Revelation 6, how those cherubim serve God's purpose. Just because we can't see them, doesn't mean that they're not there. Someone told a story one time about an Irishman, and uh, he had a case against him, and so he tried to argue from the standpoint of what you couldn't see to get off scot-free before the judge. There were four witnesses who saw him commit the murder, 
And yet, when he came before the judge, he pleaded that he wasn't guilty and wished to establish his innocence by producing 40 persons who did not see him do it. That was his case. Let me bring in 40 witnesses who weren't there and didn't see me do it. Oh, well, what good would that have been? And so 40 people declare that there's no, no power, there's no truth in the gospel. Just because they don't see it doesn't mean it isn't so. Just their blindness. And we know that those that are the Lord's, he's given them eyes to see. God has all things at his disposition and that of his son to accomplish his purpose. And here, these horses and chariots were the literally the invisible army of God that had more firepower than the horses and chariots of the Syrians. So I'm reminded and mindful too, if God be for us, who can be against us? He has all these means at his disposition, even to the point of blinding the Syrians, to where one man, Elisha, was able to lead them back to Samaria, back to that place of idolatry. Even though they were looking for Elisha, he was the one leading them, they didn't know it was him. They were powerless under the protective hand of God. And that's when we saw last time, they wanted to know, shall we kill him? They said, no. Turn them loose and let them go back. So that leads us now to where our, our text is, where we're looking at God's hand of judgment, God's hand of mercy, God's hand of protection. It's his to do with his own what he will. But in this case here, we're reading about God's hand of judgment. It says here in verse 24, it came to pass. There's that word again, that phrase, it came to pass exactly as God purposed. After this, that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his hosts and went up and besieged Samaria. Now the bands of the Syrians that he had sent down before to get Elisha, they went back and it says in verse 23, they came no more into the land of Israel. That was for a time. And even that was God's restraining hand, turning their purpose so that they could not enter. But now in God's time, after this, Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his hosts and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria. Again, as we read in Revelation chapter 6, where do famines originate? Where does war originate? It comes from the throne of God, determining all things. And how severe was this famine? We've heard and seen perhaps in our day, in recent history of cities that have been besieged and people suffering famine and hunger and warfare. Well, it got to the point here in this particular case where it says until an ass's head was sold for four score pieces of silver and the fourth part of a cab of doves dung for five pieces of silver. I don't know what to relate that to other than five pieces of silver would be a month's wages for a laborer. And things were so tight that they were even killing off their beasts of burdens to sell the head to somebody to make a living. That such was the choice between continuing to have these asses that you, they use for carrying their burden, but there's no more reason for them. And so they killed them and sold their head. You say, well, why the head? Well, that's the part that normally isn't eaten, but they kept the rest for themselves to feed on as long as they could. And the fourth part of a cab of doves dung. Someone said that such was the scarcity of, of what there was to eat, that if you had to eat dung, Probably the dove's dung was the most nutritious because of all the seeds and the fruits that the dove would eat. So they would dig in the dung to try to get some kind of nutriment, nutrition from it in order to survive. And people at that time would be asking, just like today, where's God? 
it's interesting that they never consider themselves to be the sinner and worthy of every bit of condemnation the Lord brings. They, they've got just like it is in their heart, their fists raised toward God, thinking they don't deserve this. But you look here when the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall. Now he's in Samaria. This is his place where his throne was and where the, the, the golden calf was worshipped and all of this idolatry. And so being a king, he probably had provisions that did not affect him like it was the people. So he's out and about now trying to figure out some things. We talk about a famine. There was nothing they could do about it because the Syrians had besieged the city. And this was the way that warfare was done back in the day, even, even today. Someone spoke one time about Hannibal besieging Castline where one mouse was sold for 200 pence and puddings made out of dog's guts. I know it's getting a little bit graphic, but this is what would have been, but here it's worse than that. This woman is complaining to the king. They cried a woman unto him saying, help my Lord, O king. Isn't it interesting that unless the Lord gives you his spirit, you'll not cry to the Lord. You'll continue to seek after man and not the Lord. And he said, if the Lord do not help thee, when shall I help thee? Even at this point, this unregenerate king of Israel acknowledges that this was a case beyond anything he could answer. What a blessed thing when God brings sinners to despair of themselves, to lose all hope in themselves. So much for so-called free will. This wasn't going to get any of them out. He says, when shall I help thee? Out of the barn floor or out of the wine press? So at least he's saying, what, what do you need? Because there's nothing even in the barn floor. There's nothing even in the wine press. All of that's dried up and gone. Now the king said unto her, what aileth thee? <laughs> that's kind of like modern counselors. And then, well, tell me what your problem is. And then they sit down and let the individual talk it through with them as if they have some authority and power to deal with the situation. As I prepared for this message, I recall two conversations I've had this week with some people that are desperate concerning family members and uh, other circumstances that are beyond their control. And both have indicated, you know, I've been praying and it just doesn't seem that the Lord's hearing me. All the things, was I, I, I. Well, the Lord doesn't owe us anything. But here he asked her, what aileth thee? And she answered, you talk about dire circumstances here. This woman said unto me, give thy son that we may eat him today. And then we will eat my son tomorrow. That's what it came to. Eating the flesh of their own children. So we boiled my son and did eat him. It's just undescribable to think about this. You get to such a point where the children are, are killed. But for convenience, even in our day, we've got killing of children going on every day with what they call abortion. But it's really murder of children. People, for expediency, killing these children so not to have to deal with the consequences. But here, this was a live son, boiled, and did eat him can't imagine, but they had the meal. And I said unto her on the next day, all right, part of the bargain is give thy son that we may eat him. And what she do, she hath hid her, hid her son. So now she's asking the king to intervene and make her give up her son that they could eat her. You say, this is so despicable deplorable. How could God ever, what people call, allow such a thing? It's not just that he's allowing it, he's ordained it. And this particular judgment of God, 
See, people take idolatry for granted. They think that it's okay. You know, we can worship God however we want to. Oh, no. There are consequences, and God brings his judgment. He will have no rivals in his glory and the honor and glory of his son. So even before this all occurred, if you go all the way back to Deuteronomy, this was back where Moses was preparing that second generation that the Lord had preserved through the wilderness that from 19-year-olds and down, they were not to die. And even the Lord made that distinction. But he warned them at this time, Moses did in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 49, the Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. These Syrians that the Lord brought down here to besiege Samaria, they spoke the Syrian language. It was different. It was that of foreigners. And a nation of fierce countenance. It was twice that the Lord judged the nation of Israel with these foreign nations. One was the Assyrians when they came down and took the ten tribes away, and which was just following what we're reading about here. And then the other was the Babylonians. When the Lord brought them down and took away the southern tribes of Judah. All for what? Idolatry. God will not give his glory to another. So when people say, well, what kind of God would do this? Well, it's a sovereign God. It's a holy God. It's a just God. But a nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old or show favor to the young. What does that teach you there? That shows you that all are under condemnation. It doesn't matter whether it's a child. It's the word young there is referring to even babes in arms. That the Lord would bring judgment against them because there's not one who's not a sinner. That's why babies die. It's because they're sinners. They're not innocent like people purport today. It's, oh, they're just, they come to an age of account. No, from the birth, we come forth from the womb speaking lies. It's in our nature because of being sons of Adam. So when God brings judgment, when he ordered judgment on men, women, and children, he's just in doing so. It says that he shall eat the fruit of thy cattle and the fruit of thy land until thou be destroyed. That's what they were doing when they were besieging Samaria. The people were starving on the inside but they were, as the enemy, reaping the fruit of all the labor of the land until it was destroyed, until thou be destroyed, which also shall not leave thee either corn, wine, or oil, there's the famine, or the increase of thy kind, or flocks of thy sheep, until he have destroyed thee. And it says, he shall besiege thee and all thy gates until... Thy high and fenced walls come down, wherein thou trustest throughout all thy land, and he shall besiege thee in all thy gates throughout all thy land, which the Lord thy God hath given thee. And thou shalt eat the fruit of thine own body, the flesh of thy sons and thy daughters, which the Lord thy God hath given thee in the siege and in the straightness wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee. This isn't just God reacting. It was already set in motion and declared that what would be because of their idolatry. These terrors that came upon Israel because of their idolatry. It wasn't God that was just now saying, well, I've loved you and now I hate you. No. These were purposed for condemnation from the beginning. Just like all who suffer God's judgment. That's why Christ told those women that were weeping for him as he went to the cross, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves because your house is left to you desolate. And as we read in Revelation chapter 6, that same demise 
came again to Jerusalem back in the first century. They were besieged by the Roman army until they were completely destroyed. Why was it? Well, they were still going into that temple. They were still offering sacrifices, even though Christ was the fulfillment of all of those. And only those were spared that the Lord himself was pleased to reveal himself in and draw them to himself because he had paid their debt. Otherwise, we all should suffer this same end were it not for the grace of God. And so coming back to my text here in 2 Kings chapter 6, you see, we're seeing God's hand of judgment. People mock the idea of God judging because all they're being taught is God is love. And he wouldn't hurt a flea. Well, they don't know God. They don't know his justice. And if they would, they'd quit trying to satisfy that justice by their works or their zeal. All even describe his Jewish brethren, kin, as being zealous for God, yet without knowledge. Because there's only one righteousness that God has ever approved and accepted, and that's the righteousness that his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, came, earned, and established, and God imputed there at the cross. But think of what he endured. Because for sinners, such as we are. He endured the contradiction of sin. We're all rebels by nature. We're all idolaters by nature. Why should I be spared and the other condemned? It's only the work of Christ. The only difference between Judas and Peter was the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Judas had no ransom. Left to himself, he didn't repent. He went out and hung himself. But remorse is not repentance. And so here, as we read on in verse 30, it came to pass when the king heard the words of the woman that he rent his clothes and he passed by upon the wall and the people looked and behold, he had sackcloth within upon his flesh. So he already had a semblance. It wasn't repentance because the, the sackcloth was hidden. He had his regal robes over top of it. But when he heard this, it caused him to rent his royal garment, and underneath people observe and said, oh, he's got sackcloth under there. But even that sort of remorse is not repentance. He was no more the Lord's than with that sackcloth on or off. Then he said, notice this, and here's where you see, men turn their anger ever toward God and ever toward his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. When it says in hell that there will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, that doesn't mean there's going to be remorse. There's going to be anger to gnash your teeth. The wailing is in anger. The gnashing of teeth is in anger against the sovereign God who would ordain souls to hell. People today still will argue against the fact that there is an eternal condemnation. Oh, God wouldn't do that. He's created them. Why would he do that? Well, because they're sinners. And you can see this anger of the king now, not directed at himself, not taking the blame himself, but he says, God do so and more also to me if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, shall stand on him this day. His anger was turned toward Elisha, just like those that crucified our Lord Jesus Christ. God purposed it. He ordained it and delivered him into their wicked hands and they took it and crucified him and slew him. But why did they do that? Because their anger was toward him as the son of God. And yet in all that, God still accomplished his purpose. So this, as we've seen all along, Elisha representing Christ and those who weren't the Lord's, their anger against him. This is where the king's anger stood. God do so more and more also to me if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, shall stand on him this day. But Elisha sat in his house. I love the picture here. All this going on, and here sits Elisha in his house at rest. No matter what the anger was toward him and no matter how they threatened him, they could not touch him what God so purposed. So it is with our Lord Jesus Christ. 
when they came to arrest him in the garden, the, the night they came to take him in judgment, he asked them, why did you bring staves and spears against me? I was every day in your temple. Not one of you laid a hand on me. But now is your hour. Christ recognized that if they took him, it's because the Father purposed that that would be that hour and that he should deliver up himself as being that offering for the satisfaction of God's justice for that people he came to save. But here the elders sat with him, and the king sent a man from before him. This is the king of Israel now. <clears throat> but ere the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, this again is a type and picture of our Lord Jesus Christ, knowing men's thoughts and knowing their actions and what they purpose to do. He says here, and he calls them, see how this son of a murderer has sent to take away my head. All of this, Elisha was already forewarned. But he says, look, when the messenger cometh, shut the door and hold him fast at the door. Don't let him in. And he says this, is not the sound of his master's feet behind him. It's kind of like the, the buck sends the does across the road ahead of time, but if you hang on tight, here he comes. That's what Elisha's saying here. The one that sent him is right behind him. And while he yet talked with them, behold, the messenger came down unto him, and he said, look at here, this is what the, the messenger was accusing Elisha of. He says, Behold, this evil is of the Lord. What should I wait for the Lord any longer? In other words, I'm coming here to lop your head off, to be delivered from this evil. Well, he did speak a truth. The evil is from the Lord. But rather than find fault with God and his judgments, as men do, rather than take the blame, the flesh never takes the blame. And rather than bow in <clears throat> repentance, they'll go to their deathbed angry at God. And yet in all that, all they're doing is heaping wrath on wrath against the day of wrath. Just like Paul wrote about in Romans chapter 2. But yes, all things are after the counsel of his own will. But when God judges sinners, he does so justly. And if any of us are spared, it's only because of his mercy and grace toward such as we are in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if Christ paid the debt, how free indeed we are and how thankful we are to him. It's not anything in us. All right.